Hello again, everybody. Um, all right, so uh, this is yet another update to congestive heart failure. Um, this is, I think, the fourth video I've done on CHF because the uh, recommendations are constantly changing. Um, so I just did an update to this a few years ago, and uh, it looks like I'm going to have to do another one because there's been a couple important things that have changed. So while the pathophysiology is obviously the same, the management has changed a little bit, enough to where I think it could come up on an exam, hence I am um, going to update this video. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. Definitely subscribe to my channel and you'll get notifications every time I put new videos up. All right, so also I'm making this video too, and I'm gonna make it a little bit shorter and a little bit more condensed, trying to stick to the high yield information for you. Uh, but there is another video that I have up where I go into a little bit more detail. You can watch that if your heart desires. So congestive heart failure is a disorder of the pumping ability of the heart. And there are two different uh, kinds and they're a little bit different. Um, so this is, uh, Really, um, congestive heart failure is one of the most common things that you're gonna run into as far as cardiac problems, in addition to the acute coronary syndromes. So some causes of CHF, coronary artery disease, especially if you've had an MI, weakens the heart, reduces the heart's pumping ability, hypertension, valvular disorders, and myocarditis. Common presentation is usually going to be associated with left ventricular failure. So blood is going to get backed up in the pulmonary circuit. You'll get increased hydrostatic pressure, pushes fluid into the, uh, into the lungs, and that's going to cause shortness of breath and wheezing and dyspnea and easy fatigability. Um, so if you've got a patient with these signs and they've got a history of hypertension or MI, that is CHF until proven otherwise. CHF can be divided into systolic heart failure and diastolic heart failure. Um, now they're using these terms, uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. They pretty much correspond to systolic and diastolic, but not exactly. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Uh, the symptoms and the history will give you a pretty big hint, but the only way to really differentiate between these two is an echocardiogram. And so that should always be part of your workup in a patient who is presenting with CHF-like signs. You want to get a measurement of that left ventricular ejection fraction. So relevant labs are going to include echo, EKG, chest x-ray, and BNP. This is fairly specific for congestive heart failure. So BNP is a very important test to get. The mainstay of long-term management are ACE inhibitors and diuretics, uh, but there are other important drugs uh, that we give these patients as well. Furthermore, the management is going to differ quite substantially depending on whether this is an acute CHF exacerbation or we have long-term management outpatient um, to try to prevent that from happening, okay? So, and by the way, I do have another video that'll come out tomorrow that uh, will be on drugs used in CHF where I go into these drugs a little bit more specifically. So in systolic CHF, the heart can't generate enough force to pump blood. So blood gets backed up in the left ventricle, transmits pressure back to the left atrium, and thus to the pulmonary circulation. Um, and this is basically uh, exactly what I just said. Most commonly, this is due to an insult to the myocardium, i.e. MI, and that reduces its strength and its pumping ability. So this is the pathophysiology here on a slide. Um, what I want you to understand is why each of these manifestations happen. So why does cardiomegaly happen? Because you get hypertrophy due to increased pressure. Why does the S3 gallop happen? Because you have extra blood remaining in your left ventricle that sloshes um, the, the, uh, the blood that's coming in, it sloshes up against that, causes the S3 heart sound. Um, you can get AFib. Why? Because if you stretch out the heart, it's going to cause an electromechanical disturbance, which is then going to interfere with the conduction uh, through the atria, okay? So um, it's helpful to know the pathophysiology. You don't have to, you can memorize the stuff, but I always like to know the pathophysiology because it kind of cuts down on the memorization work.
Um, so what do we see on uh, on echo? Um, we measure the left ejection fra left ventricular ejection fraction on chest X-ray. We would expect to see cardiomegaly. We would expect to see pulmonary edema and all the things that come with it, like curly B lines and pleural effusions. This is a nice little uh, diagram I made for you that kind of lays everything out pathophysiologically. Okay, so here's a chest x-ray that we would expect to see. This is just regular old pulmonary edema, just looking at it, right? So you can see congestion in the pulmonary vasculature. You can see your curly B lines. It's kind of hard to see, but if you look, it's right there. So I'm going to draw a parallel line here, and you can kind of see it's right there. And you can see another one, but it's really they're really hard to see. Um, and then you can also see effusions. Now, another thing that you see is cardiomegaly. Now, how do we determine whether something's cardiomegaly? Well, you look at the midline to the end of the rib cage, the lateral part, and that is the biggest that the heart should be. Then what you're going to do is you're going to draw a line from one side of the heart to the other. You got to try your best to find those heart borders. It can be difficult when you've got pulmonary edema. And then you compare those lines, okay? So here I'm comparing this line to this line here, and um, it's a little bit bigger, okay? So um, you'll get a more obvious answer, but or more obvious picture, but you can see here, this line here is quite a bit smaller than this line here, okay? So this is cardiomegaly. Now this is AFib. This is, again, something that's common when we have cardiomegaly because it distorts the electrical structure. Um, so you should know with AFib, you lose your P waves and you get fibrillation instead. But uh, otherwise your QRS complexes and everything else are normal. All right, now diastolic CHF is a problem with filling. Okay, so the heart can pump, but it has a hard time filling. So what? how does this happen? Let's say this is the left ventricle here and here's your aorta. Okay, and then out here is the peripheral circulation. Okay, so if you have hypertension, what that's going to mean is that the left ventricle has to pump harder because you have to overcome a, a bigger gradient. So the response of the left ventricle is going to be to thicken. It's going to be to hypertrophy and grow so it can pump harder. And that is going to be an inward growth. And so you can already tell, if you know what hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is, you can already tell the similarities here. So what you have here is a concentric hypertrophy. And that growth, because it's inward, you're not going to have the cardiomegaly that you would see in a systolic congestive heart failure, where the problem there is more of a volume issue rather than a pressure issue. Um, the most common cause, of course, is chronic uncontrolled hypertension. And um, this is the pathophysiology, which I just explained. Um, so we get concentric hypertrophy. Ultimately, it's going to um, cause reduced volume available for blood to come in. That's going to, again, it's the same pathophysiology. Pressure is going to back up uh, into the pulmonary circu circulation. You're going to get a uh, pulmonary edema from that. So uh, you want to suspect this in a patient who has symptoms of CHF but has a normal apical impulse and no cardiomegaly, again, because the hypertrophy is different. Here you have a concentric hypertrophy versus an eccentric hypertrophy that we see in systolic CHF. Echo is the best way to differentiate between the two, but history will help you. So again, you can kind of see sort of a similar pattern here, but a little bit different from the systolic CHF pathophysiology. Okay, so the left ventricular ejection fraction is important to measure because it's going to give you an idea of whether you're dealing with systolic or diastolic. So left ventricular ejection fraction is equal to the stroke volume, the amount of blood coming out of the heart, divided by the end diastolic volume in the left ventricle. So basically it's the amount of blood that's come out divided by the amount of blood that was there to begin with. That is the ejection fraction, and it's described as a percent. 50 to 70 percent is normal. As we've already said, systolic CHF is going to uh, be characterized by a reduced ejection fraction, and diastolic should be normal or even elevated. But both are going to be a low cardiac output. It's just in the case of systolic, it's because we can't pump the blood out. In the case of diastolic, it's because we didn't have a lot of blood to begin with. 
All right, now emergent management. These patients come in with dyspnea and fatigue and adventitious lung sounds, often hypotension. So of course, the first thing you're gonna think of is uh, maybe this is a COPD exacerbation. Maybe this is uh, a pneumonia. So you're always going to wanna therefore get chest x-ray and routine labs. If the patient is in respiratory distress, you may add on there an arterial blood gas. Uh, EKG is important because some of these patients will have some chest pain or dyspnea. VMP is useful if you're ever thinking of congestive heart failure. It's a little bit more specific. And then there's other things you may do based on presentation. So if they have chest pain, EKG and enzymes. If they got pleuritic pain, get a spiral CT considering pulmonary embolism, especially if they're younger. And if they're young, you could also get a TSH. Uh, hypothyroidism can lead to congestive heart failure. Your initial management is going to be to monitor their oxygenation, give them supplemental oxygen and morphine to keep them comfortable. And then we give nitrates to reduce the afterload, loop diuretics to reduce the preload, and then ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers may be given as well. What we do not do is give beta blockers. Why? Because beta blockers will slow the heart down and it can worsen hypotension. So we wait to give beta blockers until the patient is normotensive and euvolemic, okay? So the mnemonic for emergency management is LMNOP, L for loop diuretics, M for morphine, N for nitrates, O for oxygen, and P for positioning. You wanna sit these patients up upright and generally they're gonna want to be that way. It's easier for them to breathe. Now, long-term management, you need to know these four. So the long-term management is going to vary depending on whether we're dealing with a patient with uh, a low ejection fraction, namely lower than 40%, or if they have a modestly preserved or normal ejection fraction, meaning above 40%. So in patients with a low ejection fraction, we give four drugs. We give RAS inhibiting agents, and now the preferred drug is Entresto or Secubitril Vasartan. Okay, it used to be we could give an ACE inhibitor. If that wasn't enough, we, if, if that wasn't tolerated, we give them an ARB. Now we go for these, uh, what are called ARNIs. Okay, and I'm gonna talk about this in my video on CHF drugs, uh, but that's angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitors. Okay, and there's really only one drug on the market. Beta blockers are given, again, helps the heart fill. Aldosterone antagonists to reduce preload and then SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, why do we give this? Remember, what are these drugs used for? They're used for diabetes. Why do we give these for CHF? I have no idea, but they've been shown to be cardioprotective. So we give this to all CHF patients, regardless of diabetes, and also regardless of ejection fraction. So if you diagnose a patient with congestive heart failure, that patient is going on an SGLT2 inhibitor. Okay, only if they're less than 40% are you gonna use those other three drugs. If there are signs of congestion, so difficulty breathing, uh, their, their lungs sound wet, they've got wheezes and rails, uh, you'll do a diuretic. Okay, so furosemide or hydrochlorothiazide, that's regardless of the ejection fraction, but that is not given as long-term management. And then other therapy would be, of course, to manage underlying conditions. The final line of therapy, if all else fails, is a cardioverter defibrillator, especially for patients with AFib or a heart transplant, although most of these patients are quite old, uh, but that is always an option.